Hi, John. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. <laughs> Staying yeah. at home. <laughs> How are you? Is, is, that, is that your real library or a fake library? No, I, yeah. I decided to change from a Howie Beach to a library. <laughs> yeah, so it's more static. It's, 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 more, it's more, uh, more like a seminar kind of background, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, let me try to uh, share the screen. Yeah, you can get started and just have your front screen up. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Little grainy, but I don't know why. Uh, not as very high clear. Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, let me... Looks great here. Maybe. Do, one, do one thing, do one thing. When, you, when you're presenting, you might want to turn off your video. That might help. Okay. Just okay. go ahead and do that. Let's try that. Let's try that. Let's put it, put your PowerPoint again and then close your video off and just see what happens. Oh, now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. Maybe that's no, something. It's good. Is, uh, now it's good. Yeah. Now it's very clean. Very clean. No, good. no need to. Yeah, put your video on. Let's see what happens. I think I also changed something. Uh, is it good? Yeah. Yeah. Now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. I think it's just, yeah. Yeah, so there's the optimizing the video clip quality oh, option yeah. I usually use for class. Right. So I actually moved that. I think now it becomes better. It's very good. Um, it's very good. clean. Okay. No problem. Yeah, because usually oh, I teach on the iPad, so I'm not pretty <laughs> used to uh, just running directly on a PowerPoint. Let me see. Okay. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's good. This is good. This is, this is not a okay. problem. Laser pointer. Yeah. Okay. The camera. Well, once you turn to the laser pointer, it's kind of very slow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, uh, anything that uses bandwidth can be possible. Yeah. Okay. Let me just. Okay, I don't need this. Okay, I think everything is good now. Okay. Yeah, we'll wait till about ten or two or ten or three, and then get started. Okay. Uh, people are still joining in anyways. So. Give it one more minute as more people are joining and then we'll start.
Yeah, I heard that Rongui Yang has left Colorado. Is that true? Yes, that's true. He went back to China. Yes, he he took a position、uh, in the same university of of my bachelor,、uh -huh. and then he's professor there. Oh, what what was the decision? Final decision? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he started in another company in China. I guess、uh, he worked both in in the company and the university.、Mm -hmm. So probably there is, I don't know, more investment. Okay, all right. Yeah, because I I heard like maybe a couple of months back I heard that. I wanted to ask you. I keep forgetting. <laughs> Yeah, we don't know. We don't know why,、uh, but I think he has his own reasons, maybe. Yeah, that that、uh, we'll talk later about this. <laughs> okay. So,、um, let's get started.、Um, it's my、uh, pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Jin Liu, who is、uh, currently an assistant professor in our department. Dr. Jin Liu got his PhD from UC Boulder and then did a postdoc at University of Illinois,、uh, and then he came here in 2015. And since then, he has developed a lab、uh, focusing on、uh, looking at nano nanoscale transport,、uh, thermal transport. And recently, in 2020, he received the NSF Career Award, and now he's got two major NSF grants that he's working on on、uh, different aspects of thermal transport and materials. So, Jun, it's all yours. Thank you for your introduction.、Uh, good morning, everyone. So、uh, today, I'm going to share a few recent work、um, in our lab. To understand thermal transport in materials, and then use what we learn to engineer thermal conductivity、uh, in materials. Thermal conductivity actually is a familiar properties of materials. We all feel that、um, copper conducts well, and plastics does not. So, by definition, thermal conductivity is materials' capability to conduct and spread heat. Compared to electrical conductivity, as you can see from the left figure. Which spans by about 24 orders magnitude. Thermal conductivity only spans five order magnitude. So, if you have thermal conductivity around 0.1 watt per meter per kelvin,、uh, it's already a pretty good thermal insulator. And if you have a thermal conductivity around 1,000 watt per meter per kelvin, it's a good thermal conductor. So, we don't really have a large range to work with、uh, in engineering materials. Despite of that,、uh, in silicon, people have been working to、uh, tune the thermal conductivity using different techniques. Right from the、uh, natural crystals,、uh, silicon has 140、uh, thermal conductivity. You can use doping. You can use nano、uh, nano scaling uh, techniques. Uh, you can use alloy. You can make it amorphous to tune the thermal conductivity. A lot of the engineering problems have the similar needs, especially when related to thermal management. You need to control the temperature in all these devices. So, for example,、uh, in three-dimensional stacked integrated circuits, you want to、uh, release the hot spots generated in those circuits, and then you need some materials that can conduct the heat, preferably in one direction, without hurting the other layers, so that we can、uh, control. Um, the performance of the integrated circuits. That also applies to power electronics. That you want to、um, uh, control the temperatures below the threshold, so that your lifetime and reliability of the device and the entire power electronics、uh, can be there. So in these cases,、uh, heat dissipation is needed. You need the thermal conductivity as high as possible. But in other cases, like in thermal electric devices, you want to keep the thermal gradient so that you want to suppress the thermal conductivity, trying to、uh, make them as low as possible. So in those kind of needs, you want to、uh, decrease the thermal conductivity as much as possible. In other cases, you don't want the static thermal conductivity, right? Either high or low. You want thermal conductivity、uh, can be tuned on demand. So in those kind of thermal regulator needs. Uh, you want to be able to modulate thermal conductivity on demand. For example, in the car industry, if you can、uh, keep the battery's temperature、uh, a little bit faster, higher when you start a car, and then when the car runs, you want to cool the batteries. That would be the best for this situation. To engineer thermal conductivity materials, we need first to fundamentally understand the mechanisms of thermal transport in materials.、Um, 
Microscopically, now we know pretty well that molecules are a dominant energy carriers for gases, electrons from metals, and lattice vibration, which was also called phonons, uh, for insulators. And we'll also know that in the micro nanoscale thermal fluid systems, when the characteristic length scale is smaller than the mean free path, Fourier's laws will break down so we can tune the thermal conductivity of materials. So that has been well known. But what is not known, uh, well known, or we understood microscopically, is how to model the thermal transport in liquids, right, in polymers, and in complex solid. Um, so I think we'll start with that. So in today's talk, I will start with our recent work, a pretty recent, uh, how to model thermal transport in polymers and in liquids. Hopefully, we can come up with a simple theory that covers all kinds of thermal transport in different substance. And then I will provide a few uh, examples in my lab how to increase the thermal conductivity, enhance thermal transport in composite, and how to suppress thermal transport and achieve uh, minimal thermal conductivity in materials. Then I will switch to how we can dynamically tune the thermal conductivity in materials and how we can achieve a large switching ratio. So I would like to start to talk about uh, structures because um, based on the different structures, you can classify materials into other materials and disorder materials. Um, in the extremes of orders, uh, especially in crystals, you have both long range order and short range order. In the other extreme, you have no order, right? So you don't even have short range disorder. You have a completely disordered in gas. In those two types, the models for thermal transport has been established pretty well. Uh, in crystals, we can use phonon theory. In gas, we just use kinetic theory. But what is not clear is how to model the thermal transport in liquid amorphous solid, which has short range order, but do not have long range uh, order. So in those types of materials, there are, of course, a lot of efforts in the history in the past 100 years. Um, as I showed here, uh, there are available thermal conductivity model theories for crystals. You have those foam theories. For gas, you have the kinetic theories. For liquid amorphous uh, materials, there are a few. Uh, for example, for liquid, there are a Bridgman pro uh, proposed uh, an equation to describe the thermal transport. Of course, there is a fundamental mechanism associated with that model. But later people find that this model does not apply to all the liquid and still there is a, a space to work to improve. And for uh, covalent amorphous solid, uh, Professor David Cahill, based on Einstein's understanding, he proposed a minimal thermal conductivity model, which describes a lot of isotropic amorphous solid quite well. But later people also find that there are some uh, certain solids. Uh, we cannot use this model to describe pretty well. And there is no microscopic model for amorphous polymers. So um, in this year, we're kind of thinking, can we actually uh, bridge this gap to propose a model for amorphous polymer? And hopefully we can also combine all these different models together to describe liquid amorphous solid. So I'll start with the first one for amorphous polymers. Maybe you are thinking about, well, we have those gas models, phonon theory models, minimal thermal conducting models. Can I just use that for amorphous polymers? Uh, if you use gas kinetic theory, immediately you'll find that it's not true because if you apply that simple equation, you'll find the mean free pass, which is the average length for the collisions, it's much less than the bond length, which is impossible in solid materials, right? If you have something even smaller than the physical length, then uh, that definition is wrong. Then we switch to a minimal thermal conductive model proposed by Professor Cahill. We also found that uh, by measuring quite a few amorphous polymer films, uh, the thermal conductivity, minimal thermal conductive model he proposed actually uh, overestimate the thermal conductivity in these micromolecules. And in addition, there are a lot of different temperature dependence in amorphous polymers and that are not able to be explained by those gas kinetic theory or minimal thermal conductive model or any kind of model. For example, uh, amorphous polyethylene will decrease thermal conductivity with increasing temperature, while other types of polymers will have increased 
if you normalize all the different kind of polymers into a plot with respect to the glass transition temperature, you can also find that they actually have two distinct trends, right? When the temperature is smaller than uh, the glass transition temperature, uh, you will have one dependence. And then when the temperature is higher than the glass transition temperature, you have another linear dependence. So how to explain that? And can you model that? So uh, in the past year, we we're working on this and we think we, we, sh we shouldn't follow the same ideas as the past because it will end up the same result. So we come up with the uh, same, very simple ideas using a thermal resistant network model to describe the heat transfer. As we all took heat transfer class, this probably will be uh, the first thing uh, we are taught in class. Can you use some resistant network model to describe heat transfer? But that is the micro scale, right? We're talking about one meter or one millimeter. But here we're trying to use this model to describe something happened at a molecular level and see whether it still can work. Uh, we basically uh, proposed a model using the polymer chain network and thinking about intra-chain, inter-chain conduction. And we realized that in polymers, uh, you have a lot of one-dimensional chain, very long chains, and a lot of inter-chain transfer. So equivalently, topologically, this is actually a two-dimensional network. So if you write out the thermal resistant network uh, model um, and then apply to different scenario, let's see what happens. If we apply this first to the isotropic amorphous polymers, then it will be much easier because it's isotropic. You have a lot of assumptions to work with. You come up with a very simple equations related to uh, the mass in the, in the polymer monomer and the, the bonding length and then the interchain transfer uh, resistance. Uh, my PhD students actually use molecular dynamics to calculate interchain resistance and found this actually on the order of 10 uh, Kelvin uh, per nanowatts. And if we supply that value and fit it to uh, the experiment values of all kinds of polymers, you find that it's actually pretty consistent. Uh, just please ignore the top uh, dots because they're not isotropic amorphous polymers. For the bottom lines, there are all the amorphous polymers. And you can find if you use the interchain resistance on the order of 10 Kelvin per nanowatts, it's actually fits the all experiment data pretty well. Then we switch to anisotropic amorphous polymers. So we derive the few equations that describe the thermal transport uh, in a direction along the chain, a perpendicular to the chain. And then we try to fit experiment data uh, conducted on different polymer fibers with different uh, diameters. So the dashed lines are our fitting results and the solid dots are squares are the experiment data. And you can find that this model actually can explain quite well for how thermal conductivity will behave uh, at different dimensions of the fibers and different temperatures. Then one thing we're trying to move forward is that can we use this model to explain the temperature dependence that actually the previous model cannot do. So we just do a very easy uh, partial differentiate from the equation we have. We immediately found we have two terms, right? One is the minus alpha over two, which is the isothermal compressibility. And then we have this uh, minus partial log uh, interchain resistance partial T. So it is because you have those two terms, they compete with each other uh, when the temperature is below above glass transition temperature, you will basically have two approximations, at least on the right uh, part of the screen. And then those two, the form, the form of those two equations actually matches pretty well with the experiment data. Uh, as you can see, that when the temperature is less than the glass transition temperature, uh, you have this T over Tg uh, dependence. And then when it's higher than the glass transition temperature, you have this uh, negative linear dependence. So we also use the simple thermal resistant network model explained well for the temperature dependence uh, for amorphous polymers. So uh, we think um, we can add this equation to this uh, big pictures of some model. And when we add them together, immediately we found there's a lot of common things or some differences. If you look at the equation for liquid for amorphous solid and our recently derived for amorphous polymer, they are also they all have the KB and VS. VS is the speed of sound, but they also have some difference in terms of the the exponents in the N, which is the kind of atomic density, right? Can we actually trying to um, 
provide a common theory that covers all kinds of uh, uh, the heat thermal transport in liquid, in amorphous solid, and in amorphous polymer. So this is what we've been thinking about actually this year. Uh, and we put different kind of uh, characteristic figures here. Uh, for example, on the left, you can see there are liquids, uh, a, a molecular solid and polymers. Um, and we're kind of thinking, uh, are they actually behave very similar as each other? If you think about this as a network and each of the not representing either a single atom or molecules or clusters or chain segments, can you actually unite that in the network? And then figure out the path with a resistance between the knots probably can help you to explain the thermal transport, right? Because we know that within a knot, the thermal equilibrium will be very fast. And between the knots, uh, the thermal transport will be slower and that determine the thermal conductivity. So I actually skipped a lot of slides because uh, there's a lot of details here, but the result looks pretty good. We did find a unifying theory to describe liquid, amorphous solid, and polymers. Um, if you're interested, you can look at our recent papers. So the result is showing us a left-hand side figures. Um, as you can see, all these black dots are experiment data and it matches with our models. Um, on the top two figures, A and B, we're trying to use the Bridgman formula, which has been provided for so many years, to describe the liquid. You can see that um, in the first figure, the Bridgman uh, formula actually overestimated uh, the thermal conductivity for all kinds of liquid. On the right-hand side, if we use different kind of uh, small molecules, uh, small polymers with different lenses, you can see the Bridgman formula will actually underestimate thermal conductivity, especially you if you have a lot of carbons in the chain. But our model actually matches pretty well. Uh, on the panel C, you can see that using the uh, Cahill's minimum thermal conductivity model, you will estimate your thermal conductivity in certain type of amorphous solid, but this model actually predicts pretty well. And so basically we're trying to see that, we, we, which seems to find a, a one framework to describe three different types of substance, right? Liquid, amorphous solid, and polymers. And we're using the thermal resistance network model to describe it, which actually seems a pretty easy to understand uh, theory. Hopefully we can apply this uh, model theory to more materials and then trying to understand better what really happens uh, in liquid amorphous solid polymer in terms of thermal transport. So uh, with all these fundamental understandings, I want to move to how we can engineer uh, the thermal conductivity and thermal transfer in materials in terms of two directions. One is to enhance thermal conductivity, one is to decrease thermal conductivity. When you do engineering, usually you are not working with just one properties, right? Normally we're working with multiple properties and you are trying to optimize uh, a, the properties, all the properties in the materials. So here is the first example we have. We have a multifunctional goal that in this application scenario, we want high electrical conductivity, high thermal conductivity, and high temperature stability. We want some materials can work at high temperature. At the same time, they can have high electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. So we think about composite materials and putting conductive fillers, right? So that's the uh, easy way that you can get high conductivity and uh, high thermal conductivity. But if those fillers are not connected, they're just isolated islands, it's not very easy um, to make them very high thermal conductivity. And what you get is just a volumetric average. Then how to beat that volumetric average is trying to form some uh, network, right? some conductive paths. So in a more accurate term, this is basically called percolation. Right, so um, when you start to have adding different uh, volumetric concentrations of failures, when you the concentration is very small, you have all isolated particles, then the, the conductivity will be very low. But when you pass certain so-called percolation threshold, you will get those failures form a network, then uh, the thermal conductivity and electric conductivity can be very high. And this phenomenon is called percolation. So we, we're just trying to uh, realize that and then 
one of the examples we did is trying to use silver nanowire, which is the one dimensional conducting fillers. Silver nanowires are pretty long, so they have perfect 1D structures, and then the uh, electric conductivity is very high, thermal conductivity is not bad. So that will be a perfect conductive uh, fillers in our experiments. And then we choose the matrix that can sustain high temperature, which is the PD, uh, PVDF. Another reason we choose this is because it can disperse silicon nanowire quite well. So we measure thermal conductivity and uh, electric conductivity as a function of different concentrations. And what we find that is, oh, it seems like we observe that percolation behavior because you have an increase of the uh, uh, electric conductivity and thermal conductivity quite a lot with the higher and higher volumetric uh, concentration. And the highest one we achieved with 28% uh, fillers is 8.4 watt per meter per Kelvin for thermal conductivity. This is already pretty high uh, for composite materials. And then the electric conductivity is also pretty high. So we want to test whether this is the classic percolation or not. So we know that uh, if you have a percolation uh, based on the equation I showed in the last slide, the T should be 1.8 plus minus 0.2. And based on what we have in this test, uh, you can fit the T. We found the electrical percolation value T is 2.0 and thermal percolation is 1.9. So uh, it's pretty much reached the percolation uh, Phenomenon. So if you try to put seven nanowires into a PVDF so that we can use that to achieve high thermal conductivity, high thermal uh, electric conductivity, and high temperature stability. The second example is the opposite, right? In the high voltage industry, they actually want something opposite. They want the electrically insulating composite materials with high thermal conductivity to help dissipation. At the same time, they can provide a high breakdown voltage. So we need a high electrical insulation strength and high breakdown voltage and high thermal conductivity, of course, high temperature stability. So in the second example, what we did in trying to replace the failure, um, so this time we're using a boron nitride sheet, which is a two-dimensional insulating failure, uh, which is uh, insulating. But immediately we found that <clears throat> if you just use a two-dimensional insulating failure, it's not enough. So we add some silver nanoparticles serving as a zero deconnecting dots. So those particles actually are connecting those sheets together to form a network. And we're just using epoxies as a polymer matrix because it's already pretty good to have a high temperature stability. What we found through measurement is that the thermal conductivity actually increases a lot uh, with the content of these nanofillers. When you have those nanoparticles, you could have even higher enhancement in thermal conductivity. In terms of conductivity, there still remains very low level uh, at different frequencies. The breakdown voltage actually are all pretty high um, with, um, compared to uh, without any of the nano failures. So uh, what's the reason why we have those good combinations or properties? We think the reason is also um, from a network. So um, if you just have the boron nitride sheet, two-dimensional sheet, it's very hard for them to get really contacted. There is a lot of interfacial thermal resistance between those sheets. Adding those nanoparticles in between actually help to bridge uh, those sheets and help with the thermal transport. And also because those bulky part of the uh, boron nitride is not conductive, so you don't have to worry about the electrical uh, properties. But in terms of the breaking down voltage, this definitely helps a lot. If you don't have those fillers, the electrical breakdown is very easy and very directly across the film. But if you have those uh, fillers, then electrical breakdown has to go to the zigzag pass. So that will be much more difficult for the material to break down. So we think that might be the reason uh, for uh, those uh, combination of properties. But we're not stop here. Uh, we're trying to ask the student to understand how important are those bridges. I mean, it's very difficult to directly simulate this composite, but can we find some simple system, simple model to understand how important are the bridges to thermal transport? So we found one simple uh, system is a polymer fiber or polymer films uh, with the uh, 
after stretching. So there are a lot of experiment data demonstrate that if you stretch a fiber or, or the a film, you will have high thermal conductivity. And then why is that? And the current model actually does not actually account uh, the differences of the amorphous materials and all these intercrystalline parts. So we want to say, can we actually try to understand this in the molecular level? So uh, my students have did a molecular dynamic simulations and we trying to see the contributions of those bridge chains. As you can see, I show in the middle, there are bridge chains in the red, they're connecting the two crystalline parts together, right? So it looks like there is just random chains, but they do connect those islands together. And then, um, we're trying to uh, come up with the same model, resistant network model, and see whether our understanding is correct. So without considering those bridge chains, um, as you know, used to uh, describe by the series model or Choi Yang's model, compared to our data, it does not describe it well, either at high uh, crystallinity or in the median crystallinity. But with considering all these bridges, you can actually match the, the model data quite well. And that directly proves that considering all these bridges are important and bridges definitely are important to uh, help with the thermal transport. So those are all about increasing thermal conductivity, right? How about reducing the thermal conductivity? Because sometimes for some electric devices and then for insulation, we need very low thermal conductivity and we don't have a very good thermal uh, insulator to work with. So we also learned from the polymer fibers. Seems like I'm pretty obsessed uh, with polymer fibers to get a fundamental uh, insights. So uh, polymer fibers is a very anisotropic structures, right? Uh, in the fiber uh, actual directions, you have pretty aligned polymer chains. And then uh, in the uh, radial directions, you just have those vendorless forces. So we test first the PMMA fiber, which is a pure amorphous fibers. And then it's not surprising that PMMA just have the regular 0 0.2, uh, 0.17 uh, thermal conductivity, which can be completely described by the isotropic limits. So it's already being in the limit. But when we test the polymer fibers, for, for example, for spectral and xylo, which are polyethylene fibers, we found the thermal conductivity actually is lower when you apply a little bit of engineering strain. This is surprising because we think that isotropic, we thought that isotropic limit is a limit you cannot break. But now you found something actually can be lower. And what happens there, right? And then after some understanding, uh, we later on figured out, well, uh, you could have a different anisotropic limit. When the material is anisotropic, you can suppress your lower limit for thermal conductivity. And that actually serves as a foundation for us to search even lower thermal conductivity. Why the anisotropic plus disorder can actually achieve even lower thermal conductivity? We're trying to understand that. Uh, from a simple perspective uh, for phonon theories, we know that if you have isotropic and anisotropic materials, Anisotropic materials probably would have less phonon modes or number of phonons populated in particular directions. That's one reason. Another reason is that you probably have smaller projections of group velocity in that particular direction. So that provides a smaller uh, propagation speed in the materials in certain directions. But also you need something to break the possible trans uh, transportation. Right, if you just have a number, less number of cars passing a bridge um, and uh, probably that's not extremes, but if you actually put something there to block the cars, then you will completely cut the bridge off. So uh, this is also possible just with disorders because we later on find out there are different modes transporting solid and you're able to cut some of the modes using disorders. To test that, we are also just use simple model, models first uh, because directly simulating a complicated model would be time consuming and very difficult. So we asked the student to try a very simple model. Uh, we just have uh, graphing graphite layers. We assign different mass to that, create a disorder. We're trying to see even by the simple disorder in this anisotropic material, can we actually achieve a much, much lower thermal conductivity than it should be. 
It turns out when you apply different disorders, as shown in the bottom figure, you can continuously suppress the thermal conductivity in the cross-plane direction without changing a lot in the in-plane direction. So this is entirely possible, right? And then, okay, this is not realistic materials. We know that. So we need to search actually for real materials. Can we actually push the limit of low thermal conductivity? So this story comes back to uh, 2007 uh, on the science. There is a paper published uh, talking about if you have uh, two dimensional uh, materials with disordered, um, you can achieve very, very low thermal conductivity in a fully dense solid. Because usually when we talk about low thermal conductivity, we're talking about gas like air, right? Or uh, we're talking about those porous materials. But in fully dense solid, usually the thermal conductivity is quite high. And this is the first time you can achieve a very low thermal conductivity in a fully dense solid. And the thermal conductivity is only about twice of the thermal conductivity of the air. And people get excited at that time, including myself. So in 2013, uh, I published a paper in Nanoletter. We're trying to look into, well, you have two dimensional material, which is the anisotropic, right? Can I add some disorders in between? So I work with the professors in chemistry. We add some molecular uh, chains, layers in between. Hopefully that can provide enough disorders, but it turns out uh, the disorder is not enough. So what we get as the lowest thermal conductivity is 0.13, which is already pretty low, but still cannot beat the record. At the same year, uh, Mark of Siegel's, uh, which is also alumni of our NC State, uh, published a, another paper in Nanoletter. So they, they are able to tune the distance between uh, those inorganic layers. Right. And then they're trying to see whether they can push the limit even lower. So they're successful doing that because they control the spacing um, from uh, 1.3 to 1.8. And the thermal conductivity lower than what I get is the 0.07 to 0.1. That's quite already low. Um, and then we're keeping thinking about, can I actually push even further uh, to a lower limit or, or even beat the record uh, established in 2007. So recently we're working on a material called a proboscite, and then that is also two-dimensional materials, right? So with that two-dimensional materials, you, you have the anisotropic shape in the materials, and then you can add different kinds of molecules in between. You can control the disorders in this kind of layered proboscite materials. And hopefully we can achieve a very low thermal conductivity. And just a long, long time ago, uh, my student told me that, well, the measure of thermal conductivity is very promising. We showed that the thermal conductivity of this layered proboscite materials actually is even lower than what record 0.05 in a fully dense solid. So what we achieved is 0 0.04 uh, plus minus 0 0.01 experiment uncertainties. So this is even one step further to suppress the thermal conductivity in fully dense solid. And as you can see, this is much more closer uh, to the air than the 0 0.05. So I think this can provide some uh, promise or some hopes that later on we can achieve thin film type of low thermal conducting materials to uh, realize thermal insulation. Because a lot of thermal insulations are achieved in porous materials, right? In the aerogels, in, in porous materials that sometimes you cannot apply those uh, locally or uh, in a very thin film forms. Hopefully uh, by patting this layer provost guide materials, we can achieve very good uh, thermal insulation. And those materials are very easy to make. Uh, they're wet uh, based uh, process. Uh, so it's very easy to make these materials. Hopefully uh, we can end up with uh, very nicely um, made thermal insulators. So uh, that's basically a few examples in my lab in recent years talking about increasing and decreasing thermal conductivity uh, in composites and in thin film materials. And then uh, I want to switch to how we can dynamically tune thermal conductivity in materials because that will be also very interesting uh, compared to a static thermal conductivity either high or low. Um, so thermal conductivity actually can be changed or reversibly if you have structural transformation, right? Based on the understandings of a solid, uh, we know that it's really depend on the structure you have. So if you can have 
uh, reversible structural transformations, probably you can switch to thermal conductivity. And by applying those external stimuli, uh, if you can switch the thermal conductivity, then you definitely can control the temperatures uh, locally or on demand, right? Say, if you want at this time the temperature to be higher, for example, the battery in the car, you can put on on a very low thermal conductivity. But if you want to dissipate the heat and then you want to switch to a high thermal conductivity so the temperature can be cooled down really fast. So um, a very uh, important uh, figure of memory for this is called thermal switching ratio is the, how large is the contrast between the high and low thermal conductivity. So if you're looking back to the existing solid state thermal switches, um, there are different types of thermal switch in the history. Uh, there are um, some materials with very high thermal switch and ratio about 10, but it's not very feasible. Uh, you just use a fiber, so it's very hard to apply to a broad range of applications. Uh, there are also uh, polymers using a light, uh, they can have uh, transformation, but that actually isn't liquid. It's also not uh, very applicable for all kinds of solid applications. There are also liquid crystals. Uh, VO2, well, vanadium oxide actually is a thermal switch uh, as a benchmark at that time, like 10 years ago, but it only relies on particular temperature. So you have to use temperature to control the thermal conductivity, which is actually not what we want, right? Because you want to control temperature, now you control use temperature. So there are two options that we're pretty interested in. Um, and the one is called intercalation, which you ha basically have a battery-like structures to control thermal conductivity. Another one is the ferroelectrics materials that you can control the structures in those type of materials. So I'll, I'll basically focus on these two types of materials. The first type, basically, uh, it's very like a battery, right? Think about you have your phones and you need to charge at night, right? And you get a, a charged uh, phones you can use all day. So uh, it's very slow, but it's very reversible and you have a large switching because the mechanisms of this switching is based on all these leasing ions uh, intercalated or moving into the anode or, or a cathode. So that can completely change the structures of materials by providing disorder, right? As we mentioned, disorder is very important to create a lower thermal conductivity. So uh, this is reversible and it could uh, potentially have a large thermal switch ratio. Um, so we test this. Uh, we control the lithiation in layer materials. So here, what we choose is very classical two-dimensional materials, uh, molybdenum disulfide, and we put it into uh, electrolyte, and then we can send lithium ions into the compounds, right? So um, this real situation is not like that uniform. So depending on uh, how many ions you send into uh, the layer materials, you can have different voltage and you have different compositions. So by controlling the voltage and time, we can actually control the amount of leasing ions into a layered materials. And we measure the thermal conductivity of those materials and hoping that we can have a large switching ratio. So this is our first measurement results. Uh, so thermal conductivity uh, in the layer materials, as you can see those, uh, uh, black uh, round field are the through plane thermal conductivity. We found that with you charging uh, the ions into uh, the layer materials, actually uh, somewhere in the middle, you have a five time reduction of its thermal conductivity. So that's actually a pretty reasonable switch ratio already. What's more important is that at the in-plane thermal conductivity does not seem to change a lot. It's still relatively high. So you can still remain that high anisotropic um, by adding those disorders in. Um, the reason why you have the lower thermal conductivity later on we find out is because of structure disorder and that's exactly what we want. So there are phase transitions during the charging process. There are also some stacking disorders that uh, those different layers, they have those kind of rotations, relative rotations, create disorders so that can suppress thermal conductivity. Hopefully, uh, with the four to five years and less of ground, we can find more disorder systems and we can try to suppress thermal conductivity more so that you can achieve a large switching ratios uh, to make a very good solid state uh, thermal switch. So that is the one approach we're trying recently. Another approach we're trying is 
after we realize that, well, this is nice, but it's too slow, right? Thinking about how long you need to charge your, your phone, you need uh, hours, right? So it's sometimes not uh, realistic to, to have hours to change your thermal conductivity. We need something even faster. So um, we talked to uh, Dr. Jiang in our uh, department, and he actually provided a very nice type of materials called ferroelectric materials. And those materials, you can switch um, the structures even faster. So ferroelectric materials, other materials with a polar electric, dielectric that can exhibit more than one spontaneous polarization directions. In a simple words that you could have different uh, polarization directions in the materials. What makes this even more uh, interesting is that you can control those uh, polarizations by electrical field and that control is very fast, right? So you just apply and after a second, you probably already switch all these polarizations. In between different polarizations, you have something called, uh, uh, within the same polarizations, you have something called ferroelectric domains. And in between those domains, you have domain walls. By applying the electric field, you actually can control the densities of those domain walls. So hopefully by uh, those kind of electrical switch and basically switching on demand, you can control the density of the domains so that you can control their thermal conductivity. This has to be really a fast thermal switch we hope for. So um, Dr. Jiang actually provided a lot of preliminary data for how you can switch in those domain densities and it's pretty good because that's what we need. We need reversible ferroelectric domain wall switches. So uh, if you don't pull these materials, you have random distributions of different polarizations. And then when you have a DC or AC polarized polling, or you have a flat electrodes or nano electrodes, you can control the densities of the domain uh, domains. And sometimes you can uh, very nicely enhance the domain densities. And uh, because you have controls of all these densities, the resistance at the walls will create extra uh, lower thermal conductivity for the entire materials. We did some preliminary studies on this type of materials without all this uh, fancy pooling, but just a few data already showed that your thermal conductivity can be reduced by uh, uh, AC polling. And then by using different frequencies of polling, you can even suppress that even more. So this 37% reduction of thermal conductivity is already higher than the existing ferroelectric switches, which is about 11%. So hopefully with the next few years, we can come up with even better data to show that you can have a much higher uh, switch ratio. And hopefully we can have a switch ratio about two so that you can have uh, real applications. So this switch is really based on a so-called hysteresis loop that uh, at different electrical field, you can have different domain densities and polarizations in the materials. So uh, that will be very nice to see what we can achieve uh, in the future. So as a quick summary as what we have covered, um, I think through the uh, talk, I uh, emphasize a lot on the concept of the network because we find that, especially recently, this might be uh, the key to understand how heat propagates in disordered soft matters. And this is also uh, the key how to enhance thermal transport in engineering uh, problems, right? Using bridges, percolations, all kinds of uh, network concepts. By introducing wear control disorder to anisotropic materials could be a strategy to push lower limit of thermal conductivity in fully dense solid, as we showed a few examples and probably will test more in the future because this is a new type of strategy compared to uh, the previous ones, uh, combining the anisotropic materials and disorders. Let's see how much we can push the limits and get the extremes of heat conduction. I still think there's a lot of uh, room to go to push the extremes and a lot of to try, and hopefully you can bring some good news in the future. So in the rest of the five minutes, I want to kind of review a little bit what we have been achieved in the past five years. I actually thanks a lot for my uh, group members. Uh, we actually constantly hiring uh, PhD students and master's students into a group in the past few years. And uh, I think one PhD student helping 
uh, graduated and recently landed a really uh, a very good job in the semiconductor industry. And there is one uh, student we're graduating soon. And we also have uh, seven undergraduate students. Uh, most of them actually will publish papers with us, are pretty good. And we have two visiting PhD students. Students also contribute a lot to the group. Uh, we're successfully gaining the research funding about uh, 1.16 million in the past and published 40 journal papers. Um, I think the Google citations has already reached 1,600, uh, 1, showing the impact of our fundamental work. There are also some uh, student awards uh, from my group. For example, uh, Kang Hong Kim uh, recently received the IMAC Best Poster Award, and there are some student travel awards. Um, Harish is also nominated for the Outstanding Master Student of the Year Award. If you know Harish, he's really a pretty nice guy who is uh, very working hard and have very smart, I recently also find a job uh, in New York. Um, we have been uh, developed a few research tools that enables our future researchers. For example, uh, we now have a very complete molecular dynamic simulation systems so that you can simulate what happens at molecular scale, not just for heat transfer, right? Recently we did something really interesting. Hopefully we can have some collaborations. Um, we, we calculate a liquid droplet on top of a surface, trying to calculate a three dimensional contact angle. Right, so that actually pretty important for uh, for the surface phenomenon. We also calculate when uh, a droplet is moving, how the contact angle is changing, and how the angle could be different uh, in in a moving direction, opposite to the moving directions. So those uh, molecular dynamics tools could uh, provide a lot of information for the understanding. We also have a optical electrical measurement tool set up in a lab, and we'll come to uh, take a look in the lab. Um, so uh, we have an ultra-fast laser so that it can probe phenomenon really fast. We can measure uh, thermal conductivity for very thin films and, and also the interfaces between materials. Uh, we also have electrical measurement method uh, based on the resistance. We can measure temperature and we can measure thermal conductivity uh, of the materials. So uh, there are a few future research directions um, are going on in my lab. Some of them are already going on. Some of them are planning. Um, so that couples keep well with the, all the ground challenges directions. For example, uh, coupled with the biophysics, uh, recently trying to uh, analyze what behaviors will single cell will do and coupled with the, with the energy and the temperatures in a single cell. We can also couple the heat transfer with the spin-based quantum computing, as we know that quantum information is quite important. And we have been doing this for uh, quite a few years. And then um, we know that we can actually control uh, the information uh, by applying a thermal gradient in a special materials. We can also couple with heat with water for water harvesting or anti-icing coating and heat with materials, right? So for example, recently working on the self-healing materials and cooling fabric collaborating uh, within our department and with College of Textile. So with that, I want to acknowledge my students, my collaborators and the funding source. And uh, thank you for your attention today. All right. Uh... Questions, open for questions. A very good job, uh, Jun. Really interesting, all the uh, achievements that you have made in this topic. It's really fascinating to see all that. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Open, open, for the open floor for the questions. Let me see what I can see the chats. Okay. So um, uh, Jun, let me kick it off. So, you know, when we talk about superconductivity and all the stuff, we talk about material that, that are superconductive at very, very low temperatures, right? I mean extremely low temperatures, they can become superconductors. Uh, have, is there a way that you can understand what changes in those materials at the, at the, at the low temperatures that, that we could simulate at the higher temperature, at the room temperature conditions or higher temperature conditions? Is there, is there something that the thermal switch or some kind of mechanism that occurs in that, at that level? Um, I, th I think the thermal transport at low temperatures and room temperature, high temperatures are, are quite differently, right? 
and uh, the simulation method also are have limitations for different temperature range. So molecular dynamics are, are very good for room temperature, high temperature, and first principle method are pretty good at all temperature ranges, right? right. Yes. So if we have crystals, now this actually are become a routine. You can actually simulate what happens in materials in terms of thermal transport. But in disorder materials, I think still we're developing. So that's why we are trying to propose models first and trying to understand what happens. Mm -hmm. um, used to have uh, superconductivity in low temperature materials, right? So that's, that's kind of the physics advancement. Um, and recently we're trying to develop room temperature, uh, I wouldn't say superconductivity, but uh, we do have materials that are room temperature they will show uh, magnetisms without any mag magnetic element. So that would be also quite interesting. But in terms of thermal transport, I think uh, we still have a lot of uh, limits to push because like I said in the beginning of the slides, your thermal conductivity still have a very narrow range in terms of all materials still uh, from 0.1 to 1000 compared to electric conductivity. So there's a lot of uh, room actually to go uh, at low temperatures, of course, sometimes you need low temperature insulation, right? And then and, and high conductivity and at room temperature and even at high temperatures, right? High temperatures, you also need sometimes very good insulations or very good semiconductors. And in each of the range, uh, the temperature range, I think the understanding is all going on and then still ongoing. So I wouldn't say that uh, we have a very comprehensive understanding uh, even at the room temperature, there's a lot of unknown uh, fundamental questions. Anybody else? Hey, uh, Jun, this is Xiaoming. Um, hi, hi. Um, yeah, it's very interesting that my question is still related with, about the ferroelectrical materials for the uh, thermal conductivity tuning. Mm -hmm. And we, we know, in the, in, especially for those relaxed PD single crystals, their domain size, domain walls, uh, not, not only uh, depends on the electric field, but also depends on some other uh, um, factors like temperature and stress. Right. Um, do you have any um, um, thoughts about, you know, what the temperature dependent, um, um, you know, the, the thermal conductivity uh, difference for, for this type of material? Yeah, uh, actually we thought about that and that's also uh, being proposed, right, in, in the work. So uh, at different temperatures, definitely you have uh, uh, close to phase transition or far away from phase transition. So if it's too close to the phase transition temperature, you will have a very mobile uh, domain walls. So that is much more easier to control those domain walls. At the lower temperatures, you will have a higher resistance of those domain walls. Probably you will have higher switch ratios. So I, I would say we probably will try uh, different temperatures for the same materials um, to search for a higher switching ratio or a more easy switching uh, criteria or, or threshold. So I think both of these are important for realistic thermal switch. Um, I see, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jun, this is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hey. Hi, yeah, very nice talk. Um, yeah, I do have a, a one, uh, one thought, one, I, um, yeah, one, one, one point. Uh, you mentioned about the, the uh, population point. Um, for thermal conductivity. Uh, we know that percolation also can be used uh, for electrical conductivity as well. So if we can, um, for any combination of uh, two-phase, for example, if you have a composite two-phase, then the percolation point uh, may be different for electrical and thermal. Um, if we can study more in terms of that, then we can maybe find a, a good combination for um, the, um, the objective of either conductivity or insulation for, um, uh, for both uh, performance requirement. And if you bring up the um, uh, radio frequency, then uh, it's also a function of uh, uh, temperature as well as frequency as well uh, for RF domain. So I think that may be a good um, direction to, to add on as well for future. Yeah. 
thank you for a comment. I think the the reason why we started this uh, study of nanowire in the polymer is trying to see uh, whether the thermal percolation behavior is the same as electric percolation. Uh, it turns out there are probably slight difference. Electric percolation will happens a little bit a little bit yeah, earlier, and yeah. and it's also uh, once you add enough uh, feeders, they are always form a network. So that's why electrical percolation is always observed, or very often observed in composite materials. But uh, instead, the, the thermal percolation is not easily observed, and and there's still kind of a lot of debate on that. So uh, to form a thermal percolation you probably have a larger percolation threshold and a more uh, kind of uh, requirements for to form a percolation thermally, because that's also the difference, like I mentioned, that you have electrical insulator and conductor, you don't have some absolute thermal insulator. So even though you can have very low thermal conductivity in polymer matrix, but still they're, they're not insulator, they still conduct heat, right? But electrically, if they're insulating, then it's insulating. So that's the difference. So it's very hard to, to actually achieve absolute insulating and conducting. So in terms of thermal percolation, uh, you have those isolated islands and cluster that can still conduct heat in somehow in some approach. So that's why it will offset the percolation threshold and then the behavior could be different. So uh, I think what you mentioned is correct that we can look into uh, how different they are and whether you can engineer that, you know, at some range you have electrical uh, percolation without thermal percolation or uh, in other ranges you have both. Yeah, so, I think, yeah, I think the study will be very useful. Yeah, so we, we nice. definitely need some uh, materials collaboration for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll be happy to. Yeah. Thank you, thank you again for the talk. All right, any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is Yong. Uh, Jin, uh, you talked about the uh, layered material, right? You put some, what well, to suppress the thermal conductivity, you put some polymers uh, in between. So I'm wondering how does that compare to a pure 2D material based on Van der Waals interactions, right? We know for electrical conductors, conductions, it will be a big problem because the electrons has to hop across the layers. Yeah, which is very difficult. But how about uh, for the thermal uh, transport? Mm, so um, there was 2D materials. It will suppress thermal conductivity. So our starting point is the Van der Waals two-dimensional, right? So two-dimensional materials that are 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 held together by Van der Waals. So that's the starting point. Usually the thermal conductivity is not that low. Uh, in graphite is actually seven and in other kind of two-dimensional materials like uh, one to five. So it's for, for still pretty high. And then by adding those uh, molecules or ions into that, uh, well, of course, you are adding some pathways, but uh, the disorders also make sure that you can destroy some of the phonon paths so that you can suppress some conductivity. It's kind of a competition, but eventually those disorders will win. So your thermal conductivity will keep suppressing uh, to a very low value. So uh, that's kind of the, the key source we have for those type of materials. Yeah, I, I see. But how about, uh, how does the phonon transport across the layers? I mean, is, is, is easier than the electron hopping? Um, well, it's, um, it still have, you still have all these phonon pictures. You have those uh, phonons, like wave-like phonons, and then you have those random walk uh, kind of uh, transport. Um, I mean, it's very hard to compare with electrons because you have uh, different kind of mechanisms to hop from the first layer to second layer, or all the layer actually will vibrate together. So I don't think there is a direct comparison but I would say you actually have a large room to tune that. You can tune from a very good transportation to a very bad transportation across the layers in two dimensional materials. Uh, well, for electrons probably, uh, I think you probably will have the same thing, but electrons were more likely just hop between the layers. So there are some uh, research talking about you can keep the high thermal conductivity, uh, high electroconductivity 
in that direction, while well, you can suppress thermal conductivity to make a good thermal electric materials. So I would say you probably have more room for thermal conductivity to be low. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna shut it down here at this point, 11 o'clock. And uh, thank you, Jun, again, wonderful talk. It was really uh, you know, lot, not a lot of learn about. Uh, so uh, thank you again, and uh, hope everybody will have a great weekend. Uh, it's supposed to be a little co cooler, but enjoy the weather. Thank you. Hope everybody have a good weekend.